Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, and I recently picked up a 500 watt isolation transformer that appeared to be in very good condition, and the price was right, but there's a dark side to this story. The label indicates that this transformer was certified for medical and dental use. The output has two standard, three prong, 120 volt outlets, and I believe the leakage spec is 100 microamps maximum. The input has a nice strain relieved heavy duty 14 gauge power cord with a 5 amp slow blow fuse. Opening the input side of the unit shows quality construction and what appears to be a Faraday shield that connects to the chassis. So far everything looks good. The output side when opened shows more good construction with a 7 microfarad AC rated film capacitor across the secondary side of the transformer. However, there is a major problem with the neutral wire of the AC output being directly connected to green wire ground. This makes the use of this transformer dangerous for general purpose isolation transformer use, but I'm quite sure that this wiring was done by the factory. There are numerous isolation transformer videos, but this video is about understanding why this transformer was wired this way and how it can possibly be called an isolation transformer. In an attempt to try to figure out what the possible reasoning for making the connection between the secondary side of the transformer and ground was, I built some circuits in LT Spice. I did it in LT Spice rather than SimSmith because I think in this case LT Spice makes the schematics a little bit more readable. But nevertheless, it could have been done in SimSmith just as well. And in this case right now, I've got a GFCI block here, which really there's nothing here. All it is is, is three one milliohm resistors, but I'm going to turn it into a ground fault circuit interrupter. And I believe the reason for doing the grounding has something to do with ground fault circuit interrupter uh, compatibility. So what we'll do here is we've got a load. In this case, it's a 24 ohm load, which gives me at 120 volts a 5 amp load, which is about what my a little bit more than what my transformer spec for, but it's a 5 amp load in this case. And I've got a couple components here that I can connect to ground. Each one of these will produce 10 milliamps of peak current. And I just wanted to go through this real quickly. So the first thing let's do is run this, run the analysis. And what we're going to do here, a ground fault interrupter looks at the difference in current between the hot and the neutral. So this resistor has current going to the right. This resistor is specified with current going to the left. So we'll click on this one and we'll come up here and we'll modify what we want to calculate. So we'll do I1 minus I, I2. And if we plot that, we'll see that there's no current here, even though that the, the current in R1 is 7 amps peak, which is the 5 volts, or the, excuse me, the 5 amps RMS. And the current in the neutral is 7 amps, and they're both the same phase and everything because of the way the directions of the currents were specified for the resistors. So net, but the net current is zero. So what a ground fault interrupter does here, let me get rid of those two plots that we don't need any longer. What it does, it looks for a current imbalance of about four, four, five, six milliamps, something like that. And if it sees that, it opens up the circuit indicating that there might be a fault, a leakage fault to ground somewhere. So let's connect a leakage, a leakage uh, case here. Start off by connecting the 17k ohm resistor from the hot side to ground. If we connect from the neutral side to ground, no current will flow here. But let's just let's do this and run this simulation. And what we see is that the the difference in current between these two uh, two paths is 10 milliamps peak, which is what we'd expect to see with 170 volt peak circuit and 17 um, k ohms of resistance. And I also set this capacitor to give me the same value when I run it again. It's also 10, 10 milliamps. So both of these are currents that are adequate enough to easily trip any normal ground fault interrupter circuit. And of course we can see that if we connect this, this point here, here we won't see anything. We see one microamp or something and that's, that's just noise in, in, the, in the LT SPICE simulation. So, remembering this circuit, we're going to use this circuit and we're going to put a transformer in the middle here 
and we're going to look at what happens in this case. So now we have the same circuit we had before, except for the fact that we added an isolation transformer in the middle. This is not necessarily a transformer I have in this example, but it's close to it. It's got a couple capacitors across from the hot side on the primary to both sides of the secondary, indicating some leakage. Uh, the two coils are connected together with a coefficient of coupling of one. They were, they're two, two Henrys apiece with 0.8 ohms of series resistance, which is reasonable for a 500 watt type transformer. And I've got a 24 ohm load like I had before. It will draw 5 amps. And I've got these two fault conditions. I do not have a connection from here to ground at the moment. Let's just leave this as an isolation transformer. If we leave this as an isolation transformer, we would expect, or let's just say this, I would expect that if I had a fault here, that I wouldn't be able to see it. What, this, what would happen with this isolation transformer is this point would just move right down to ground, very little current would flow here, and what we would see here wouldn't be enough to trip the GFCI. So before we do that, let's run this circuit, get a plot of, that, of that, the current there, and let's do like I did before, which was subtract the two currents. And what I see is an 80 microamp peak current that flows here, well below 4 or 5 milliamps that would trip the GFCI. And that's with a current here flowing that would have been 10 milliamps peak. Now, if we look at this current right now, what we'll see is it's, it's low. It's the same 80 microamps. This point here was moved almost all the way down to ground, just a, li just a little bit above ground due to, due to the leakage in the transformer. So this circuit would not trip the GFCI through the isolation transformer. And let's real quickly make the connection be a capacitive connection, see if that has any difference. Now we need to look at the current through uh, C10. And we see that C10 is, get rid of this one, we don't need this. And C10 is the 10, is 80 microamps again, and it's the same current as what's flowing between the difference of these two paths right here. We see that with the isolation transformer, we have isolated the effects of the potential faults out here from the ground fault circuit interrupter with a true isolation transformer. Now let's connect this wire here, as they did in the transformer I actually have. Let's reconnect the fault here and see what happens. Let's run the circuit. And what we see here is, oops, is this is the current we want, sorry. What we see here is 10 milliamps of current flows here, which is what you would exactly ex expect with this connection, but yet the ground fault circuit interrupter doesn't see any of it. All it sees is 30 microamps, which is the leakage again. So in this case, even if we connect this connection to ground and we have current flowing out here to ground, we don't trip the ground fault circuit interrupter. So this circuit actually is an isolation transformer. It isolates ground fault tripping type circuits from the ground fault circuit interrupter. It's kind of a different kind of isolation transformer, but it kind of works the same way. So thinking about this a little bit more carefully, we could ask ourselves, why would you possibly do this? And the reason you do this is because this outlet now appears to be wired the same way as a normal outlet back here would have been wired. And those little uh, devices that you can get to plug, plug into the outlet to test the, um, the validity of your wiring, they would work just fine here. Without this connection, they don't, they don't work. But with the connection, they work fine. And any faults out here aren't transmitted back. And you might say, well, why shouldn't I transmit the faults back and, and let the ground fault circuit interrupter trip? Well, there's a couple of good reasons for that. I was fortunate enough to have a couple uh, contracts when I was working to design some medical equipment. And all medical equipment I've ever seen is very, very good in terms of filtering out any noise on the AC power line because they're scared to death of having that compromise the uh, validity of measurements that they make on a patient or something like that. So consequently, we end up with a lot of equipment that has capacitors 
that go across the line to filter out differential noise and from one side of the line or both sides of the line to ground. Actually, it doesn't matter if the second side of the line, line is going to ground or not. I can demonstrate that real quickly here. Get rid of that and um, we'll add a, a, a capacitor here and then we'll copy that capacitor, put it over here and we'll connect it on both the other side of the line. Now in this case, this would be typical of kind of capacitance as you'd see to, to a differential filter. Now you might say, that, well, these capacitors are way too big. And the answer is yes, they are way too big. But remember that a lot of medical equipment are very small monitors. They only draw 50 watts, 20 watts, 30 watts. And you can end up with several, several of these in parallel on one circuit. So if each one had 0 0.02 microfarads going to ground and you had seven of them in parallel, you'd be at 0 0.14 microfarads and you'd trip the circuit again. So I believe the transformer is built for that purpose alone um, to protect the medical equipment, which has extensive filtering under, at the front end, front where the AC comes in, and yet still be compliant with ground fault interrupters. And um, whether or not that's right or wrong, that's the only solution I can come up with. I looked around, didn't see anybody else who made any comments about that. Uh, if anybody knows better than me, please uh, put a comment below in the video. But nevertheless, for our purposes, as you know, electronics experimenters and stuff, all we want to do is come along, do that, and be done. Now, we don't, we don't really want to be playing games like this particularly for the most part. What we want to be doing is tying one side of this to ground for a scope probe or somewhere in the middle for a scope probe or not having to worry about getting shocked as much. Um, an isolation transformer protects you because now if you connect yourself from this point to ground, and let's just do that with a direct wire, the current that would flow in this case would be, it's this current right here, which is the same as this current right here, it's still the 80 microamps. That's kind of the reason. I believe that's to be true. If you get one of these transformers, uh, you should ohm it out ahead of time. You should remove that, that ground lead if uh, you intend to use it as a regular isolation transformer. And then you should move forward. I'm going to do a real quick analysis of what actual currents flowed in the transformer I had once I removed that, uh, that ground lead. Now I've removed the potentially dangerous ground strap. And let's look at this transformer when used as a isolation transformer as would typically be used by somebody perhaps in ham radio or just in general electronics. And the first thing we notice is with 120 volts on the input, I have 123 volts on the output, 123.7. And that means this transformer is a slight step up in voltage. And that's due to the fact that there will be voltage drop across this transformer at 500, volt, at 500 watts. And they wish to make on average uh, the output be the same as the input. At a 200 watt load, this transformer produces 120 volts on the output with 120 volts on the input. But that's not really that, that important. Let's look at the leakage current that flows. So what I've got here on, these, on this uh, connection is a standard plug plugged in here with standard conventional color coding for the United States with black being the hot or the small uh, prong in the, in the uh, outlet, the white being the ground or, the, or the neutral or the large prong and green being the uh, round prong. And let's measure leakage current that we would have. Put, we'll put this in the current mode and the first thing we'll measure in the current mode is the leakage from the nominally hot side to chassis or to, the, to earth ground and that's 58 or 59 microamps. 59 microamps on this side and on this side, it would be 11 microamps. I've measured several isolation transformers over the years, and none of them ever had the same leakage on both sides. The windings are such that one of the sides of the winding is going to be closer to the other winding, and that's just the way it works. But in this case, we're going to call it a, a 60 microamp leakage transformer. Now, how much is 60 microamps? And... 60 microamps. Let's do a little test here. I'm going to risk my life here. And I'm going to use my body. I'll wet my fingers first of all. 
and I'm going to touch this lead and this lead, and I'm going to be the path. And I can't quite get the 60 micrograms. Wet them again. Almost 60 micrograms. I cannot feel 55 micrograms through my fingers. And I've done some other tests in the past that indicate nominally through my hand or from my hand to my arm or from my hand to my leg, I can't feel anything uh, that's below about 250 microamps. But in this case, 50 microamps is absolutely um, unable to be recognized by me. So, anyways, that's one, one thing to keep in mind. So this transformer has 60 microamps. Now let's look at something a little bit different. Let's look at voltage, or let's look at resistance first of all. I made a little resistive divider here, and these resistors are each 100K. And they've been matched to be extremely close to the same values. This one shows as 100 point, say 47K, and this one shows to be 100.52k, almost exactly the same. And we're going to put those across the full voltage and then we're going to ground different pieces of this, different pieces of this circuit. Well, primarily the center point, we're going to see what we get. But what we would do here, in some cases you would want to put an oscilloscope on the output of this circuit to measure voltage and we know that the shield side of the probe is always ground, or always earth ground. So now the first thing I'm going to do is look at the voltage across both of the resistors with two meters. Both these meters are very, very close to being the same. They're within like a tenth of a volt or so of each other. I'm just sitting this on the on this little piece of plastic here so that it's a little more, a little more visible in the video. Kind of have to hold the leads here in place. So we see 61.7 or 61.8 volts across both sides. Now what's going to happen to those two resistor values as I artificially ground different parts of the circuit. So let's start off by grounding the center point. If I ground the center point of the circuit to earth ground, the two voltages rise a tenth of a volt, but they're all virtually the same still. And they're both the same voltage. I go over here to the hot side, or the nominally hot side, two tenths of a volt difference, and over here nominally to the neutral side, they drop down a little bit and they're like two, one tenth or two tenths different again. Turns out that if we were to put a scope across here and tie the shield side of the scope to anywhere in this circuit, we could read adequate voltages, or no, accurate enough voltages, that this transformer doesn't get in the way. Now, I could raise these resistors up to be one mega ohm and we would start to see some differences, but 100K is probably pretty reasonable in a circuit like this. So this, this transformer looks to be like a, a pretty good isolation transformer once the ground was removed. And that's how I intend to use it. I hope this video has been useful and informative. As usual, likes, thumbs up, and comments are appreciated as they increase the chances of this video being seen by others. Thank you again.